Well, what's up, Mosaic? How's everybody doing today? Fantastic. So glad to be here today. As he mentioned, my name is Pastor Ernest Grant. I had the privilege and the honor of serving as the lead pastor of Accelerate Church, which is a new life-giving church in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, as he also mentioned, I'm uh, 15 minutes outside of Philadelphia, so I don't mean to alienate you here, but uh, fly, eagles, fly. Yeah, I just wanted to, I don't know if I could say that. I'm so, all the people that are booing, it's okay. Give Lamar, con, give Lamar his contract and you should be good there for the foreseeable future. All right, all right. Just wanted to test that out. Probably won't do that for the second service, but uh, all right, all right. Got a lot of stale looks there. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. You, you look Jalen Hurt right now, you know. That was good. That was good. That's not in the notes. All right. All right, now that you're all warmed up here, again, I don't even know why I said that, but it's okay. Man, I'm so grateful. Man, can you give it up for Pastor Jonathan? Man, he is a phenomenal leader, a dear friend of mine, really, really critical thinker. I'm so grateful for him in my life, and I'd be remiss if I did not recognize my brother and my friend, Pastor Mike Winger, in the building. He is great. He's on my board helps me to navigate through the contours of church planning. Man, I love you and I'm so proud of you. Thank you for helping me out so much. So let's jump in, uh, let's pray and then we'll get to it. Father, thank you so much that we get the opportunity to do this. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word, Lord. I thank you for this amazing church. I pray that you will bless us and be with us in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're anything like me, there's a chance that you have a love-hate relationship with technology. I mean, one minute your device is working perfectly on your desk, and all is, and all, it's, it's harmony, it's an amazing thing. The next is going haywire, and you just want to take it and throw it out of the window. Now, now, what happens to me is my inclination initially is to hit the power button so that I can reset the device. And I'm no expert in technology, I'm not a, so a computer expert, so please don't uh, approach me after service and tell me I got this wrong, but I'm hoping that when I turn off that device, and I restart it, when I turn off that gaming console, uh, when I turn off the computer, the iPhone, or some other off-brand device that you may be using, uh, my hope, that's good, that was a good one, that was, that was a good one. I'm gonna keep that joke in there for the second service. Yeah, that was a good one. But I'm hoping that when it restarts, it doesn't restart with the same dysfunction that it once had. And I think the same thing that applies to our digital brands and devices also applies to our life. Because let's be honest, like we want to restart 2023 without the dysfunction of 2022. We want new and fresh vision and fresh perspective. We want to kick off the year the right way. So Jonathan has been helping us in this series called Reset. He's been encouraging us to slow down and to, to diagnose our hurry sickness to establish new rhythms, to embrace this idea of silence and solitude so that we can cut through the clutter and the noise so that we can experience the peace, the power, and presence of God in 2023. Well, that's something that he promises to all of us who put our faith in Jesus. And listen, these are all great practices, and I think they're going to really, really impact and help us to reset in 2023. But I also want to encourage you to not overlook the efficacy of consistent and regular Bible reading. W one of the best ways to restart your 2023 is to make a habit of continuing to read the scriptures and anchoring all the spiritual truths that we've learned over the last few weeks in a deeper truth called the scriptures. Now, I know you might be wondering, Pastor, why in the world should we read the Bible? Why should I wake up a few minutes earlier uh, in my day when I can be laying in bed or scrolling anxiously on my phone, don't you know that those are better alternatives to getting up and reading the Bible, right? right, right like, why would I read an archaic book that was written centuries ago? How does it apply to my life today? So what I want to do is, over the next few minutes, I want to help us, I want to I help us as we're thinking through this idea of resetting, I want us to consider the critical role that Bible reading plays in our passage today. So I'm going to be in 2 Timothy 3.16 today. This is um, just to give you some context as we work our way there. This is a gentleman named, uh, writing this is the name Apostle Paul or Paul. And um, um, he planted churches all throughout the Mediterranean region in the first century. 
And, and he's writing in this passage in 2 Timothy, which is a letter to his young protege named Timothy, as you can imagine. He's, he's been serving in Ephesus for quite some time. Um, and they haven't corresponded in about a year or so because there's been a lot of persecution during this time. He hasn't had the opportunity to really communicate with him. Uh, but in this dark and damp prison, in this Roman jail, he, he writes or he pins what we can describe as a state of the church almost. And he's addressing his young protege, and he's letting him know um, about the looming changes that are going to happen with his departure. And he's encouraging Timothy, I need you to do a few things, son. One thing I need you to do, I need you to draw on the rich legacy and the, and the heritage of your faith that was given to you by Eunice and Lois, your mother and grandmother. I, I want you to, to remember all of these things. But before I go, let me encourage you with this. He says, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, I know we love that, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You know, over the last uh, several years, I've grown in my love for reading books, and I especially love reading memoirs. Uh, I'm finishing up a memoir by uh, the ESPN commentator Stephen A. Smith right now, uh, who happens to be uh, from Philadelphia or work for Philadelphia, uh, just FYI. And uh, he's, uh, he's fi finished up this content. It's called Straight Suitor, and, and it's an immersive experience into the life of this kid that grew up from a poor child in Hollis, Queens, in a broken family, all the way to becoming one of the most recognized people in the world. And, and as I was reading this, I constructed all of these images in my mind of his childhood. I mean, my heart ached as I listened to him talk about the death of his mother and the death of his big brother, Basil. And, and then I, I experienced a, a sense of joy as he was talking about uh, becoming a father and becoming a household name on ESPN. It, it was as though I could hear his voice as he wrote, and I was vicariously living through his spoken images. And I know that we live in a society where reading is not as popular as it once was, but as I was reading this memoir, I was reminded of just how much reading impacts us. I mean, think about it like this. Think about how you feel when you scroll through your news feed or your timeline. Think about when that friend begins to air out their political views or they talk about their, uh, their, their, they talk about their political views or they're airing out their business online. Think about how that affects you. Think about how, how it impacts what you on, in the way that they say these things. Like if you're reading a memoir or, or a news feed, it can affect your worldview. It can affect how you see that person and how you actually feel. Well, if, you're, if the news feed can do that, if a memoir can do that, I think God is letting us know that it can happen even much more so as we read the scriptures. Because to some degree or another, the scriptures are a memoir. Is God revealing the intimate things about himself so that you and I could understand his character. You and I can understand his desire to be with us and so that we will know them. So with, it, with that in mind, here's what I want to do today. In the first half of this message, I want to be your seminary professor. And I want to tell you a little bit about the role of inspiration and revelation. On the second half of this, I'm going to give you four reasons why you, I want to encourage you to make reading of the scripture a daily habit of your life. Is that fair enough? Okay. All right. You're going to amen by taking notes? Just okay. All right. Just, just need to know. Just need to know here. I'm used to a few more amens than that. If, I tell you, if, you, if you say amen, I promise you I won't lose my place. I promise you that. I'll be fine, right? You know, if, if, it's, if it hurts, just say ouch. That's all you have to do, okay? All right, so when people discuss the Bible, when we talk about the Bible oftentimes, we think about it like, oh, it's a, it's a great book, but really I think it's more accurate to describe it as a, a library of books that have been written over a period of time. And, and Paul says in this verse, he says that the scriptures are inspired. He says the scriptures are inspired. So sometimes when we think of inspiration, we think of this feeling of exaltation. It's a spirit of feeling like our, our souls or our spirits have been lifted. Like, you know, when you hear your favorite song and you're just like inspired by hearing it, or some of us get into nature, or maybe you practice meditation on the scriptures, and it's just like this feeling of euphoria and joy. And those are beautiful, and there's places in the scriptures that are inspiring, 
But when the Bible talks about inspiration, it's more focused on what Dr. Tony Evans describes as overseeing the composition of Scripture so that the message is recorded in holy tomb without error. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying here. So, So that's inspiration, but there's also this thing called revelation. Revelation is what God discloses about himself through the Scriptures. Let me ask you a question. When you meet someone new, are you one of those people that, that share intimate details of your life immediately? Or, are one, or, or do you hold back such information and only keep it for a select few? I, I, I'm the former. I'm going to tell you everything up front to see if you're going to be my friend, right? I'm an oversharer, if you will. I'm just going to tell you that right now. You'll be like, I didn't think we would have all those personal details within the first 15 seconds. And it's like, all right, I'm weeding you out. You know what I'm saying? Right? I'm weeding you out. Right? But, you, but, but when we share those intimate details, that's what we would describe as self-disclosure. Like, like you want people, you're sharing details about your childhood experience, for example, or your fears or your regrets. But it's not just sharing details or sharing details. Like you're doing so because you're, re, you're telling them a little bit about yourself so you can build relational intimacy. And what we see in the scriptures is that God is revealing himself over time until he fully reveals himself through Christ Jesus. So all those beautiful and cute stories that you read out, read in the scriptures, all of them are pointing to Jesus, who's the fuller and the most comprehensive picture of who God is. So, so that, that's what's going on. He's, he's slowly revealing it over time. And what we learn about the nature of God is that he's loving and that he's compassionate, and that he's kind, and he's, sacri- he's self-sacrificing. That is the beautiful, beautiful picture of the revelation of God over time, that he over- and he oversaw the composition so we could have it in holy entombment. It's beautiful. But one of the big reasons why we need to read the scriptures is because, in the words of Rich Velotis, we really need the images of God in our mind healed. So many of us have these terrible images and misperceptions and bad images of God. These unhealthy concepts of who we think he is. We're like, God wants me to try harder. God wants to punish me when I do wrong. God is angry with me. Some of us are going through suffering right now, difficult and hardship, and we're like, God, are you for me? Are you with me? Can you be known? Are you distant? But a lot of times, God will allow us to experience suffering and difficulty and it, because it will cause us to talk to him and, and come out on the other side with a deeper, richer, and more profound faith. And so it's, it's, not, it's not that God isn't with you. Sometimes suffering is affirmation that God is actually with you. And that he's got your back and he's willing to walk with you through the narrow crevices of your life and the valleys of your life to let you know, I love you at any state of your life. And so he goes on. So Jesus is this beautiful image, but some of us just need our images healed. Because we think about it like this. Some of us think this way. We think, well, God's this angry deity. And he just wants to make me miserable. And he does so through these ancient commands in modern society, and then he employs, I got it, well, he employs these people called pastors who are like the fun police in contemporary society. And then on top of that, the pastors hoard all the power and use it to oppress people. And let me tell you, if that's the God you think you serve, you're serving the wrong God. You're serving one that's a figment of the imagination. Because what what we see through this beautiful story of the scriptures is that God created each and every one of us in this particular place and time. Each of us has inherent beauty and dignity and worth and value. And at the same time, however, we're keenly aware of our brokenness because sin has entered the world. And that's why there's all this dysfunction and oppression and injustice. But God reveals through, the, through his loving character by sending Jesus to experience death on our behalf. To eventually rise again on the cro- rise again after dying on the cross, to welcome us into a new family, to give us purpose and meaning, and to restore the dignity as, of, that was lost. What we see throughout the scriptures that he's self-disclosing is that God is loving, God is trustworthy, God is sacrificial, and he. You know what I love about God is that he's willing to stand up to our biggest bullies. I don't know about you, but I was bullied in in, in high school a little bit. Because I wasn't that tall. Well, I used to be taller. Well, no, I didn't. I never was taller than this. <laughs> I wish. 
I wish I was tall. I'm standing right now because I have these platform shoes on at a solid 5'8", <laughs> killing it. And so, you know, when you're my height, sometimes you get bullied by people that's a little taller than you. And it would be so refreshing when someone would be like, yo, leave him alone. And that's what God did to our biggest bullies called sin and death. He said, I'm going to stand up to them so that sin can ultimately corrupt your life and so that death cannot ultimately overtake you. I love you. I'm with you. I'm here for you. And I'm going to show it the most in the cross when I died for your sin and the resurrection where I conquered death and I stood up victoriously over it. That's the picture, friends, that God shows us throughout the scripture. So through this book, this book that was written by 40 different authors over a 1,500-year period in three different languages, in three different continents. This is God's self-disclosure so that you can know him, the power of how much he loves us, and so that we can experience wholeness and be welcomed into his family. So revelation, friends, is what God said and did, but inspiration is recording what God said and did without contamination. So if you're looking to reset, friends, and you're looking to practice the spiritual disciplines, as Jonathan has explained over the last few weeks, let's make sure that they're anchored in the truth of the Scripture. And so because some of us are asking questions, God, are you with me? God, can you be known? Well, maybe this is his RSVP to all of us to dig into the text, to make sure that we have consistent practice of Bible reading so that we can know him and be a part of his family. And so not only is it uh, inspired, but I think it gives us four reasons why we should read the Bible. Are you ready for them? Here's the first one. It tells us what we need to know. It tells us what we need to know. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm sure that you're naturally inquisitive. And you probably ask the question, is there more to life than this? Because in the words of one poet, here's kind of the human experience, although it's not universal, Here's the human experience. We, uh, we essentially startled out of our sleep by an alarm in the morning. We scroll anxiously on our phones. We leap out of bed because we spent too much time on our phones. We shower. We force feed. We fight through traffic or get in our PJs and get on Zoom to have meetings. <laughs> and then, uh, then we make money for someone else and told that we need to be grateful for it. That's kind of some of our stories. Not universal, but, but Paul is saying... Like, listen, there is more to life. He's given us a resounding yes. He's saying that the scriptures when regularly, should be regularly consumed because they answer a lot of the deep questions that many of us have, right? Is there a God? How can you know him? Who is he? What's my purpose for my life? What lies beyond the grave? And how do I determine right and wrong? There's a, and on top of that, there's a principle or precept in the Bible that helps us in everyday life. It tells us on how we should deal with our trauma, how we should make uh, wise decisions, or how to deal with difficult emotions. How do I challenge my assumptions? Like, not only in the scriptures do you get the full revelation of God, but you get an ancient book that has modern relevance. And it guides us and navigates us through the pitfalls of contemporary life. And so Paul is saying to us, like, if you wonder whether reading the scriptures is helpful, he's saying it's profitable. There's an ROI from you doing it, right? Like, like maybe you're wondering about money and the utility of it. Like some of us use money to, as security from a rainy day. Some of us use money as a means of wearing it on our, in our clothes or driving it around because we want significance. And what Jesus is saying is that I am your security. I'm the one that protects you. And on the other one, and I'm the one that gives you security. And I'm the one that makes you feel relevant. So, and so the money that I give you is a tool by which you can, of course, pass down generational wealth. And, of course, take care of your family, but expand and help you develop and expand the kingdom of God. There's answers for the problems that we have in life in the scriptures. But it's also, it also shows, friends, that maybe you're struggling with a divorce today. Maybe you're going through a chronic illness or this is a tough season, and he reminds us that I'm near to the brokenhearted. But on top of being near to the brokenhearted, I have empathy because I've been through the challenges that you've experienced. I know what it's like to lose a loved one because I lost John, my cousin. I know what it's like to be deserted by friends because all of the disciples left me. I know what it's like to experience pain because my friend Lazarus died. Like Jesus is deeply in tune with what we feel and we can know more about what he wants for us in the scripture, son. Some of us are wondering today, 
Well, what about wisdom? How do I claim that? Well, Jesus' little brother says this. If anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask of God, and he'll give it to you generously. You know what that means? He's not a stingy God, but one that wants to bless us. So, friends, as you search the Scriptures, and as you critically think and process what you read, what you'll find is that you can find better answers in the Scriptures than you can in chat GPT. GPT, you can do that. He wants to give us answers. So that's one. Here's the second one. It tells us where we've gone wrong. It tells us where we've gone wrong. On the other hand, he says, it's good for rebuking and correcting. I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of rebuke. <laughs> that's not, I don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, man, I'm looking forward to getting rebuked today. I, I, don't, I don't feel that way, right? But, like, but what, he's saying, like, what he's saying is that the Bible helps us with that. There was a time in my life, you may not believe it because I like to describe myself as sweet as cherry pie now, you know, because I'm trying to get emotionally whole and practice the contemplative rhythms. But there was a time in my life where I was just very angry about everything. I was very nitpicky and a bunch of other things. I remember a friend came up to me one day and he was like, Ern, can I talk to you? I was like, yeah, of course you can talk to me. I'm a person. And yeah, come talk to me. And he says, I want to let you know that um, you're not very life-giving like you once were. And in fact, you're constantly angry, and I like to describe you as being an emotional cancer. Yeah, I know. Isn't it? I, know. I know. It's not how you talk to somebody like me. I know. And with the maturity of a five-year-old, I looked him in the face and I said, leave me alone. That's all I could muster at the time. Right? Even though his words were sharp, I know he loves me. What I appreciated was he confronted me in private before this issue became a big deal in public. And one of the things that I love about the scriptures is that when you read them, sometimes God will just have a little talk with you in private so that the issue won't become a bigger issue in public. I, there, there was a, I, I was going to skip out on this event that I agreed to go to, and I was like, nah, I'm not going to do this. And then I read that piece in Proverbs that said that you keep your word no matter the cost. Right before I was going to cancel, I was like, come on, Jesus. Like, come on, leave me alone. Let me do what I want to do, Jesus. Let me be the autonomous self right now. Let me make my choices. But the scriptures will confront you. Like my wife tells me this all the time, baby, you better listen to me in private. I'm trying to help you because I don't want you to go out there in front of people and be embarrassed. And they tell you the very same thing that I've been telling you all this long, all along. I see your blind spots. And what the Bible is telling us is, I see your blind spots. I know where you've gotten along, where you've gotten awry, and I will take this ancient text because it's a living, breathing document, and I will lift it up and apply this ancient word to your heart so that you don't make foolish mistakes in, in public that can be dealt with in private. Are y'all with me today, church? He, he just wants to have a conversation with you. Here's the third one. Is it offers solutions instead of pointing out problems? <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, church, but I'm seeking to be more patient in 2023. I'll let you know it's not going that well, uh, but I'm trying. <laughs> I'm giving it a go, just so you know. I'm really trying. Um, I'm trying to be more patient when uh, Hulu buffers. Amen. <laughs> right? Anybody else there? Right? I'm trying to be more patient with the YouTube ads that play, uh, which is, yes, uh, all day long. I'm getting tired of that. Uh, I'm too cheap to pay for YouTube premium. If anybody wants to sponsor me for that, God bless you. <laughs> I'll put my cash app up here in a second. I just can't do that. I just cannot do that. I cannot pay for YouTube premium. Shout out to anyone that does. Um, it's not going that well, but you know what I'm really asking God for wisdom and patience for in this season is I'm trying to be patient with people who point out problems but don't give you any discernible solutions. You probably don't have anybody in your life like that. Nobody? Okay. I'm the only one. That's good. That's good. Like, they just point out problems. They're kind of nitpicky but they don't have the time to help you fix the thing that they said is a problem, even though you know it's a problem, right? And so what I love about the scriptures is, is that Jesus, through the scriptures, points out problems in our lives, areas that don't align to him, and then he offers solutions to help us fix them. He gives us his spirit, which lives on the inside of us, and then he takes that written word, helps, it to, helps us to see the modern relevance so that we can turn the corner. Like, he's like, yo, I want to help you heal from your, your habits. I want you to heal from your old histories. Like, like I want to help heal you from the unhealthy relationships and the broken family dynamics. Like, what he's trying to do is, is, is help us grow and mature in his grace. When I was younger, I had braces. 
I don't know if anybody had braces in here. Like I wasn't one of them people that could uh, that can rock that that can get the gap off, like a rock the gap and it looked cool. I didn't I didn't have the Michael Strahan type of gap. Like I didn't. Like one tooth was like facing the other. I remember it was one time I was at lunch and this guy was like, I remember his name. I'm not going to say it right now, but he was like, "How do you brush your teeth?" <laughs> Why y'all laughing at that? That was a traumatic event in my life. It's because I'm an Eagles fan. That's what it is. Yeah, you're Jalen Hurt. That's why you're, you're Jalen Hurt, yeah. And so I remember, right, my, I told my dad about it. I'm in tears. So he takes me to the orthodontist. I go to the orthodontist, and they put the braces on my teeth. And I remember I was really in the X-Men back then, and I was like, is this metal made of adamantium? Why is this thing so strong? Doctor, did, is this the same metal that they bonded Wolverine skeleton with? And X-Men, like, it was excruciating, right? It was like pulling my teeth, and it was hurtful. Like, it was terrible. There was no Invisalign. Jesus, where was the Invisalign at? It was, it was not there at the time. And so I didn't have that, but then I realized, like, over time, the braces were, they helped close my gap. They helped to make me feel confident in my smile again. And what I realized in, in a higher and holier way, that the Scriptures are like the braces of God. That, that when you read them, what he does is he, create, he, he corrects your behavior. And sometimes it might hurt. Sometimes it might be uncomfortable. But he's doing it out of love so you can walk confidently in his love and so that you can have a deep and robust faith. Like he's using his words so that our hearts may be in alignment with him. Here's the last thing. God uses the scripture to help us become spiritually fit. Spiritually fit. Like, so Paul says that he used the God used the word to train us in righteousness. I don't know about you, but I've uh, I've been fighting the dad body recently. I've been starting to go to the gym a little bit, and uh, you know, I, you know, I just didn't like how it looked in the in the videos on YouTube, right? You know, they would chop up the videos on YouTube, and I didn't like how I was looking. I mean, I wasn't body shaming myself, but you know, I didn't like it, and so started going to the gym, working out, and I got a I got a trainer, right? He's a really good trainer. The only thing I, that I struggle with him is uh, he will make up an excuse to take off his shirt at any time. I don't like trans. And so he's one of those guys that have the abs that stop, like, you, you know what I'm talking about? The abs that stop, like, back here. And so, you know, sometimes I, I would sneak a peek. You know, I just want to, <laughs> really platonically, I'd just be working out, like, doing the exercise, and I'd just, let's just look back. Like, I wanted to see where they stopped. Let me just tell you that uh, jealousy is a great motivator as well. <laughs> and so we're working out, you know, we're working out, and he's like, you know, you got, you know, we go through the first set, and I'm like, whew, man. He was like, that was just a warm-up. I was like, the warm-up? I'm done. I'm sweating. I'm out of breath. I got my little Apple Watch on. It says I'm in the fourth zone. I'm, I'm done. Right? That's it. I burned 78 calories on the warm-up. I'm done. My ankles are sore. I'm finished. Right? So, yeah, he looks at me like that, too, really incredulously. And so, uh, and so here's the thing about trainers, right? Here's the thing about trainers. Trainers are trying to get you in shape, but they're trying to help you adopt a healthy lifestyle. They're trying to get us to, like, you don't gravitate towards health. It's something that you have to work at on a regular basis. So, but what, do, what trainers do is not only do they help you use the equipment and, and get you on a healthy diet, but what they're trying to do is motivate each and every one of us to live a counterintuitive lifestyle. And what I like to say is that in a higher and holier way, that's what the scriptures are doing us. They're training us to leave behind futile and self-destructive behaviors that we don't naturally in line with. They're, they're trying to help us align to the character of God and promote spiritual vitality. Here's the thing, like, and God is like, I, I, he is willing to work with us in our childlike training. And this, and this implies that he's like a parent that wants to help us develop social and spiritual, social and relational skills so that we can be equipped for every area of life. So friends, let me just say, like, as you are considering this whole notion and this idea of resetting in a new year, like, yes, absolutely, pursue the Sabbath. Absolutely, go ahead and, and, and figure out time where you can uh, rest and cut through the silence of the day. Absolutely, diagnose your unhurried path, uh, unhurried, your hurried sickness. But I also want to encourage you to read the Scriptures. Because no one that has read the Scriptures and gleaned from this holy book has ever looked at the, the writings and the wisdom and being sad that they or regretted that they ever read it. And so I want to encourage you today to read the scripture. Now, you might be saying, Pastor, okay, where do I get started? I know for me, one of the best things for me to do is to go to the Psalms. The Psalms are like an ancient prayer book that you can read and study. And what I love about the Psalms, I don't know about you, but 
it, it's almost, it's, it, that's not a good analogy, but anyway, <laughs> not an appropriate one. Uh, this is not an appropriate one, probably. Yes, probably not an appropriate one. But when you read through the Psalms, I love how it's real and gritty. It's not, like, it's ominous at times. Psalm 78, the writer is saying something like, or 88, he's saying something like, darkness is my only friend. It doesn't all end in a happy ending. Like, like David is running for his life from his friends. He's, he's struggling emotionally. Like, if you're having emotional struggles in this season, I want to encourage you to read the songs because you'd be surprised about how deeply relevant they are to your life. Maybe you're trying to figure out who this person Jesus is. And you're trying to look, learn a little bit more of him. Your friends have been telling you that he's this savior, and you want to know a little bit more about his story. I want to encourage you to read the book of John because he introduces you to Jesus and how he loves us and considers us, and he does it in a, in a great fashion to help us engage with him. And so, friends, I just want to tell you, like, if you really want to know God today, and you want to know the, his power, and you want to experience and understand this thing that Christians experience, like this power and presence of God that we talk about so often, I'm saying one of the best ways you can do that is by picking up your Bible in this season, getting on the YouVersion app. I go through personally the Nikki Gumbel one year in the Bible plan. Because when I get to Revelation, I just need it to read to me sometime. I'm like, no, I don't know about these pale horses and the tattoo down Jesus' leg. Just read it to me today, Nikki. <laughs> He's a pastor in England. So read your, I'm just encouraged. Get on the U version app. They have some great ones on there. And start reading the scriptures. And I guarantee you, if you do it for the next 90 days, it will help transform your life. Why don't you let me pray for you? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. And thank you that you give us the scriptures to encourage us and to help us to navigate through the difficult contours of life. Jesus, I just pray for all of us in here. I pray for the person that's kind of skeptical about it all. I pray that you encourage them and let them know, Lord, that this is the self-disclosure of God. He's revealed himself to us through the scripture. And I pray that you would encourage us, give us um, clarity, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.